Okay, good afternoon. This is CIBE 638, Sedimentation Engineering. Uh, my name is Victor M. Ponce, and I'm a professor at San Diego State University. And uh, this today uh, is the second lecture of the second week. I, we call it our 022 class or 022 video. Um, let me get into the material. Okay, can you see now? The page? Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can. Okay, so we are now, we're looking at river mechanics. Today is the 1st of September. So this is the fourth of six classes of this chapter. And uh, I'm going to start at 812, covering 812, hopefully to get all the way down to 17. We'll see if we can do that. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do today is to backtrack a little bit because I know that many of you, as a matter of fact, I think all of you have not taken open channel hydraulics. And I do, although I did put in there for you to read the material, I think it would help if I reviewed some of the material with you, some of the more basic material. But you will allow me to go fast on this because the intent is to kind of review this material with you. So if you have never taken this material, which I highly doubt it, because a lot of this stuff is very basic hydraulics and you have already taken basic hydraulics. But let's just get started anyway and we'll see how we, how we head on on this or how do we progress on this. The first thing I'm going to be talking today is the Chessy formula. And how, is, how we derive the Chessy formula is interesting. First of all, let me go back a little bit in the history. I love the history. Mr. Chessy is a Frenchman and he was an engineer in the uh, 18, 1800, right? Yeah, uh, no, uh, 1700. Well, 1770, more or less, right? whatever, whatever, that's 18th century, by the way. And um, he, he was doing drainage. Um, and he was asked, or somebody asked him, or he decided to develop a formula to calculate the velocity based on the friction, of course. The velocity in a channel it depends on the amount of friction in the boundary. So he decided to do that and he developed the Chessy formula. It is somewhat a little bit convoluted at exactly what he derived. And we have a, a story on that that I'm gonna share with you briefly tonight. Uh, but the way in our book, and I'm looking at our book now, uh, section two of chapter five of my book in, on up and channel hydraulics. Uh, so we discussed the Chessy formula and we start with the so-called quadratic equation, which we refer to in the literature as quadratic equation, not very well known by civil engineers. And the reason is because 99% of the engineers work with the Manning formula, and 1% works with the Chessy. Uh, other formulas we put aside for some reason. That is not quite correct in my opinion. There's actually five formulas that we can work with as a matter of fact in terms of uh, the velocity of a channel. And I'm going to review the five formulas later on today. But we start with this formula, which, which is called the quadratic friction law, which says that the shear at the bottom is equal to rho mass density, F, which is a type of friction factor or drag coefficient, and V squared, and that's why we call this the quadratic friction formula. So we, uh, in order to develop, develop the Chessy formula, then we figured out what the shear force should be developed along the wetted perimeter of a control volume. And we're looking at this graph in here, and we say that it is the shear times the area. And the area uh, is P, the wetted perimeter that you see in here, times the length of the control volume. So that's easy enough. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a shear or a stress times an area. That's the resisting force. And the acting force is the gravitational force resolved along the direction of motion, which gives us the force of gravity equal the weight of the, of the element, the weight, weight of the control volume, times sine of theta. But typically, because this is, all these channels are of small slope, uh, we can equate, uh, in an, as an approximation, the sine of theta with the tangent of theta so we end up with this tangent of theta, which is S, which is the slope, 
So in here we have gamma A, A, L is the, is the weight times the slope. And once we put these two things together, the, gra the, the force of gravity, the gravitational force, and equating that with the resisting force, which is over here, over there, right? 5-4, equation 5-4, we get this equation, which we can then manipulate as you follow the algebra in here, and we solve for V, and we end up with this equation. That's what more or less, I'm not going to say exactly what, that's what more, that's the kind of thinking that led um, Chessy to the Chessy equation over here. Chessy did not quite derive the C, but he talked about it in, in some terms that were very much related to, what's, to what we have put in here in equation 510. Interestingly, as will be, will be apparent later on, the Chessy coefficient is defined as g over, over f, g gravitational acceleration over f, 1 to the 1 half uh, root, which means that rf in equation 5-3 is exactly equal to g over c squared, g over c squared. We stress this a lot, a lot more than more people would normally do because we have actually contributed in this area and we like to share some of the things that we have done over the years. So we have the definition, the standard definition for our friction uh, factor in here, which turns out to be one eighth of the Darcy Weisbach, we'll explain that later on, is G over C squared. So as you can see, this is one way uh, to non-dimensionalize the Chessy coefficient because F is non-dimensional. And finally, over here, we can continue uh, working on this equation and end up with this formula over here, with this formula, which is a formula that had benefited us for a, a long time, for almost 40 years. It's not a formula that you'll find in any book, by the way. As a matter of fact, it's a formula that you, you will not find in any book but mine because we kind of contributed and we like this way of, of, of doing it. And the, re the reason why I like it, I'm going to explain to you later on. Okay, so it, it basically, everything that we've said in here has led us to this equation 516, which says that the slope in a channel is equal to RF times the fruit number square. How simple an equation. Okay. So if we have a fric the friction factor F, how does it vary? Now, we know that the friction factor F is one-eighth of the Darcy Weisbach, which we know from... Uh, hydraulics. So if this is 0 0.002, the Darcy Weisbach is 0 0.016, and so on and so forth. 5 would give us 40 over here, and then we we uh, we can calculate the Chessy definition, or the, defini the Chessy formula, in SI units and in U.S. customary units. Interestingly, uh, Chessy was using some other units at the time because it was 250 years ago, and he apparently didn't know didn't know about these units that we currently work with, which are the SI units and, and the U.S. customary units. So in SI units, we get these numbers for the Chessy coefficient. In U.S. customary units, we get these numbers. Note that, note that uh, uh, ostensibly, that the uh, Chessy coefficient is a function of the system of units because it's right here, you, we have the definition, the G comes in, and the G can be expressed in two ways, as you know very well. Briefly, I'm going to talk about the history of the Chessy formula, and this is, by the way, in my book. You can revert back and go read it again if I had talked about this a little bit too fast, which I have a tendency to do that. Um, he was born in France in 1718 and died in 1798, so he lived 80 years. Uh, he worked on this. Chessy, the, 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 the important thing in here is that Chessy was given the task to determine the cross-section, the cross-section and the related discharge for a proposed canal on the river Yvette, which is close to Paris. And he had been collecting experimental data and so on and so forth. He wrote an article in 1975, which was titled Thesis on the Velocity of the Flow in a Given Ditch. Imagine, 75, 1775, it was a great contribution. It was 250 years ago. 
he wrote another paper in 1776, which apparently that's this paper where he first presented this idea about the Chessy formula. And that's this document over here. Being French, he was using symbols that are, we are not used to, unfortunately. But here over here, we have the A, A is the area, and P is the weather perimeter, and H is the slope. So the area of the weather perimeter becomes our hydraulic radius and the slope over here. So it's a little bit interesting, weird, the way he wrote it, but it is correct. It's the area times the uh, hydraulic radius. The hydraulic radius is A over P to the one half. And this is the coefficient that he said it was 272 in an old system of units. And this is all taken, by the way, by me from the original doc, not original, but the documents that have been written about Chessy. There's a book written on Chessy, only Chessy, okay? In the metric system, and this kind of relates to what we just said earlier, I think it does relate. Yep, right, in the metric system, it would be, it would be in here somewhere. It would be a little more than 44. No, actually, take that back. It will be 31, which is in between. No, a little bit less than 44, so it will be it'll be a higher friction factor than this and this. But that would be in the metric system. And of course, in France, they weren't using the US customary. The US customary was being used in England until the, I believe, about 100 years ago, or even 50 years ago, when the British dropped it and went with the metric system. So the only country currently that, uh, I guess you could say, by statute or by practice, remains in the US customary is the US. We're the only ones that work with the feed pound system still. The rest of the world is working with the SI. That's the name. The name is SI. So that's the story and the history of the Chessy and the Chessy, the definition of the Chessy. Now let's look at the Manning formula. Now the Manning formula is kind of related to the Chessy. And we apply the Manning formula blindly. It's this formula over here. And this formula has uh, a, sp a specific characteristic that is listed with a one in the SI system, it, but if you use it with the US customary, it's 1.486. People argue wrongly, I believe, that the Manning formula does not have, does not vary with the system of units. And that is not correct. The Manning coefficient does not vary, but the formula does vary, as you can see. You have to keep track. If you use this formula in the US, you're, it's wrong, totally wrong. It's about 50% wrong. So suffice it to say that the Manning, because of this feature that it is a constant for both, even though it's really not a constant, it has been, uh, it has become very popular over the last 100 years. Let's take a look how that happened. Okay, so the definition of the equal or the definition of the C coefficient in terms of the Manning is this formula here, which can be found by replacement of one on top of the other. Okay, so that's the Manning formula. And in here, now we're going to be looking at the, at the history of the Manning formula so that we can come up with some realization as to why is it that we are still working with the Manning formula. Manning was born in France and died in, in 1816 and died in 1897. So he was uh, next century, it's uh, the 19th century. But in, in, in 1826, he moved to Ireland and worked as an accountant, 1926. Uh, he moved to, no, Ireland, right. He was born in 1816, and so he, after, when he was 10 years old, he moved to Ireland and eventually worked as an accountant. In 1846, during the year of the Great Famine in Ireland, Manning was recruited into the Arterial Drainage Division of the Irish Office of Public Works. 46, he would have been 30 years old. He was working as an accountant. After working as a draftsman for a while, so he was first an accountant, then he... Uh, I guess there were not that many engineers. They had the great, great famine over there. So he, they hired him as a draftsman. At that time, there was plenty of people that got employed as draftsmen, you know, the draftspersons. He was promoted to assistant engineer. So he became an engineer by rising through the ranks. He actually didn't go to school. In 1848, he became district engineer. Can you believe he got promoted to district engineer? He, he hadn't got to school. That happened in the 19th century. 
a position he held until 1855. As a district engineer, because he was already an engineer, he figured he had to do some, some study after the fact, and he read the book, the Traité Hydraulique, I don't read French, French, or I don't know French, but the Avison de Vosons is a French book, after which he developed a great interest in hydraulics. He was employed by the Marquis of Downshire while he was supervised the construction of the Dundrum Bay Harbor in Ireland. Manning returned to the Irish Office of Public Work in 1869, and it was already assistant of the chief engineer. He became chief engineer in 1874. He was born in 16, so that would be a 58 years old. At 58 years old, he became chief engineer. He did not receive any formal education in fluid mechanics or engineering. His accounting background and pragmatism influenced his work and drove him to reduce problems to the simplest form. So what did he do? And I'm second guessing here based on the knowledge that we have. He had, a, there was a bunch of formulas at the time that were presuming, uh, pre the presumption was that they were going to calculate open channel velocity. Uh, the the Wa formula, the A.L. Wine, Weisbach, St. Venant, Neville, Darcy and Basin, and Gangelet and Cutter. So he figured out, and I'm assuming that he did that, he didn't know which one to choose out of these six formulas. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, out of the seven formulas. So what he did is he plotted all those formulas, all those seven formulas in a piece of paper, and he drew a line in the middle. Can you believe that? He drew a line in the middle, almost like saying, I'm gonna do a correlation here in the middle. His original formula is written in there, which he later simplified. And in, in, a few years later, he gave the, the exponent of the hydraulic radius the value of two thirds, because that's what he felt he should do at the time. So this is the famous formula of Manning, 1885, appearing in 1885. So it's about 130, 130 years of age. And then he said to Flamand, who was one of the contributors at the time, he said the reciprocal of C, the C was like the Chessy coefficient in the front of the velocity, corresponds closely with that of N as determined by Gangelet and Cutter. Gangelet and Cutter, both C and N being constant for the same channel. So Gangelet and Cutter had a coefficient in there over here, can you see? And he said that the, it was actually a, a coefficient or a factor in the denominator. So he said that the gang gangulet and cutter N was going to be in his formula. So people nowadays are saying it wasn't really Manning's N, it was gangulet and cutter's N that got into the Manning formula. That's kind of a picking a little bit on the name, but that it, it is correct. Even Manning accepts the fact that his Manning N is not his, it's really from uh, these two other gentlemen. He proposed the, for the first time the formula in, 19, in 1889, and the formula saw the light in 19, 1891. And then there's an interesting story about this. The Manning didn't like his equation because it had a two thirds in there, and at the time it was extremely difficult to get up, get, calculate a one third root, the one third root. Uh, of uh, of anything, we didn't. They didn't have the calculators that we currently have right now. We almost have forgotten how to do the. We can maybe do the square root, but not not the third root, one third root. Uh, so therefore, he recommended some other equation, and this is the equation that he recommended. But as you can see, that's a, that equation was too long and too complicated. And there's a rule in life that says, keep it simple. It's a kiss principle. You may or may not have heard. Keep it simple, stupid. Okay. Uh, people didn't pay attention to Manning at the time, so he didn't. He didn't like his formula. He wanted another formula, but that other formula was too complex, and so people decided to go with his formula. He didn't have anything to do with it because eventually he was going to die, right? And he died in the year 1897, right at the turn of the century. And then there's a whole bunch of people in England, France, and Germany. That's starting, uh, I guess you could say, advancing his ideas, and um, and that's what happened through his handbook of hydraulics in 1918.
Professor King of the University of Michigan, I believe, led to the widespread use of the Manning formula, as it is known today, as well as to the acceptance that the Manning coefficient should be the reciprocal of Cutter's n, correctly stated. So Professor King was one of the uh, stalwarts in, I guess you could say, uh, uh, propagating and popularizing the use of the Manning formula in the United States and eventually throughout the world. So why uh, did I make such a fuss at this point? Because I do believe that the Manning N is incorrect. Why do I say that? Because the Chessy formula is dimensionless. Chess is not intended it to be dimensionless, but it can be put in a dimensionless form, as it has been done by some people, including myself, later on, of course. And hydraulics is a science that has to be converted to dimensionless form in order to be correct. That we believe profoundly. So I do believe at this point that Manning had a problem. The Manning formula had a problem. It was an empirical formula. It's not, it doesn't even rise to the level of conceptual, while, while the Chessy formula is fundamentally deterministic. It was based on hydraulics, as I have already derived the formula today for you, on, on fundamental principles of control volume and balance of momentum, balance of mass and momentum, so forth. So with this long story made short, or long, short story made long, I uh, stress in here that while we use the Manning equation and we recognize the wide usage of the Manning equation, we believe that it should be eventually uh, superseded by a function that is more in tune with what Chessy said than what Manning said. But it's not going to happen. I'm telling you it's not going to happen. Just because I said it, I said it, so in here it's not going to happen. It, it will depend on practice and usage, and I know for a fact after being in the field for more than 40 years, that things don't change readily. If they're going to change, there's got to be a revolution, and there's got to be a lot of time before that happens. So what I'm going to do at this point now, it's going to go back to our syllabus in here. And I was thinking about this yesterday, and I said, I believe that our students don't have the background to discuss all these issues. So I sat down. And, uh, and wrote this thing yesterday. I wrote it down. I fixed it. I prepared it yesterday. I put all the formulas that I believe should be, we should know about as we discuss the issues of friction. And uh, because we need the issues of friction before we proceed ahead in sedimentation engineering. So I'm going to repeat for you in here a bunch of equations that are, have been considered in the past by various researchers throughout the world. The first and foremost, of course, the Manning formula. We already know the Manning formula. Its date is about, as I said earlier, 1888, I believe, or 1891, due to Manning, who was a Frenchman, but he was working out of Ireland. The Chessy formula preceded the Manning formula about 100 years. Chessy was a Frenchman also, uh, but in working out of, out of France. And the Chessy formula, does not look dimensionless, but it can be readily converted to dimensionless form. How do we do that? All we need to do in here is to take, uh, divide by square root of the C by square root of G and multiply it by square root of G. And use this as the parameter, not the C, because the C is a function of G. But C over square root of G, that is an independent dimensionless value. Who first used this equation? That's interesting. The name is Simons. My professor Simons, for whatever reason, and I never asked him about this, because I guess it was the, the time didn't appear. But in his paper that we're going to read next time we meet, hopefully, he has a very long paper on sedimentation engineering, the beginnings of sedimentation engineering, because he did his work in 1957, 57, 58, when he was a student. Uh, a doctoral student at Colorado State University. And at the time, can you can imagine, 1957, there was not a whole lot of hydraulic development, or it was in shipping, and it was just beginning. So, But he used this formula in here, and I'll show you later on where is it, C over square root of G. At the time, I thought that he had come up with something that 
It was not necessary. You know, we always have a tendency to criticize what other people do. I said, no, that's not needed. But eventually I learned something more and a little better. And I do believe that Simons was halfway in order to get the right answer, which is the answer I got many years later. Okay, he was just halfway. He never proceeded to complete the equation, to complete to where we got later on. But for us, it was interesting because it led us to some development of some ideas that could be done. So this is the dimensionless chassis, as you can see. That is, this is the way to dimension, to non-dimensionalize the chassis formula. Okay, so from here, we have to develop now the quadratic velocity equation, which I presented today outright. I said, this is the quadratic velocity equation. But where does it get from? It gets from the chassis. And where does the chassis get from? I already told you earlier today, from a, a, a balance of uh, mass in, in a control volume, so the, from basic principles. Okay, so we, have, we are going to go to the quadratic velocity equation from equation four, which as you can see is the same as equation three, right? Yeah, because I want to do this step by step. Okay, so now we go, we square this. And when we square, square this, we get V squared equal to, to C squared over G, right, times GRS, correct. So we get that equation five. Then we, mu we multiply by rho in the, in the, uh, in the left uh, side and by rho on the right side, and we get this rho V squared equal to C squared over G times rho GRS, correct. But we now recognize that rho G is gamma. Gravitation and mass density leads, leads us to unit weight. Gamma, gamma is the unit weight. So correctly, seven derives from six. Can you see that? If I'm going too fast, uh, go back next time or later on and examine these equations but because they are correct. Okay, from here, rho V squared equal to this C squared over G, we reckon that it is one over F. We already had said that. RF, gamma RS. So now we get, and gamma RS is tau. That is the, the bottom friction. I already derived this equation last, last week, uh, last uh, Tuesday. So this is tau. So tau is equal to then F rho V squared. So this is this, our so-called quadratic equation, which we found out or derived many years later. I'd say it would have been like t 10 years after, maybe 20 years after I learned from Daryl Simons or I began to learn from Daryl Simons these issues back in the year, the, the class of the year I took this class with of river mechanics and sedimentation with Simons was the year 1974. It's exactly 48 years ago. Okay, so we get this equation here. Subsequently, by the way, we use this equation in many instances. As a matter of fact, I think I said something improper. I developed this equation originally for my dissertation in 1976. So it was not too late or too or later too many years after I had learned about it that I developed. And the reason why I did that was because in my dissertation, I needed an easy way of figuring out what the friction was going to be. And it also had to be dimensionless because the entire treatment that I was doing was dimensionless. And we specialized in doing this kind of stuff though, which subsequently led to, to my famous S-curve, which is also dimensionless. Fortunately, I had very good teachers out there at Colorado State that instilled me all these, instilled on me all these ideas about how to do dimensionless formulations of hydraulics. And finally, last but not least, we have learned about the Darcy Weisbach formula because it is in the literature and it is part of hydraulics. I am positive that when you took 444, if you did it at San Diego State, applied hydraulics, you learned about the Darcy Weisbach, which was originally used, a formula that was originally used in pipe flow, but eventually it was also used in open channel flow. So the trick in here is to properly convert the darcy Weisbach equation, which was originally designed or de developed for pipe flow to open channel flow. 
So this is the Darcy Weisbach equation. If you don't recognize it, this is the head loss equal to the Darcy coefficient, Dar uh, Darcy Weisbach friction coefficient, times the length of the pipe, times the diam over the diameter of the pipe, times the velocity head, V squared over 2G. You will recognize this as the Darcy Weisbach equation. So how do we get to the how do we get from there to the quadratic? Right here. It's very straightforward. Well, not quite, because it hadn't been done by too many people. Uh, so we take the L and put it in the denominator over here, and H sub F over L becomes S, becomes the energy or the friction slope. So the L and the D, we put it in here because it's in the denominator over here. So it goes into the denominator, denominator over here. So you can see that it is a corresponding, right? And then we replace the D by 4R because when you, when you move into the open channel, the diameter is equal to the hydraulic radius times 4 because the hydraulic radius is a fourth of the diameter. There's a relationship that you must have heard or learned when you took hydraulics. So this D then becomes 4R, and there's an 8 in here instead of the 2. So once the 8 goes in here, then we can take the 8 out of there and put it under F sub D and V square over R over here. Now GR, which is in the denominator of equation 14, goes to the, to the numerator on the left side, GR, that is equal to F over D, no, F sub D over 8, right, times velocity squared. And now we get in here, GRS is, when we multiply by rho, we multiply by rho over here, so that becomes tau, and there has got to be a rho on the right side also, because we just did that. And as you can see now, we end up with the quadratic equation. So the correspondence of the Darcy Weisbach, and its way of expressing it as a friction factor, which turns out to be one-eighth of the Darcy Weisbach, has been proven by using two ways of doing it, the well-accepted Darcy Weisbach equation and also the Chessy equation. So we have to conclude that there's a tremendous similarity between the Darcy Weisbach and the Chessy equations. Only the Darcy Weisbach was developed for pipes and the Chessy was developed for channels. But the flow is one and the same. A different shape, but the flow is the same. So as you can see, tremendous correspondence. And I don't think anybody argued about the Darcy Weisbach. So, so we confirmed that, in fact, the Darcy Weisbach and the Chessy are cousins, basically. So where does Manning come in in all this? Manning is, uh, is basically the foreigner in the problem, which came in, established himself very well, and has persisted over the last 100 years. I'm not going to be the one to kill the Manning equation and take it out of practice. It would be some other person. I don't think that is my job. All I'm telling you is that in our opinion, the Jesse equation and its surrogate, the quadratic equation, the quadratic velocity equations, are theoretically better and fundamentally more sound or sounder than the Manning equation. And that's one of the reasons that which led me to all this thing, because when I did my dissertation and the subsequent work that we did, we realized that we couldn't get too far from with the Manning equation. There was always a problem of completeness, or rather you can say closure. There was no closure in this stuff. There was always something missing or something that was too much. So we decided that the only way that we could solve that problem of closure was to go to a dimensionless formulation, which we successfully did. Subsequently, many years later, not too many years later, back in the year 1995, we were doing, um, we were teaching open channel hydraulics. And I was not, uh, I didn't like the presentation that Chow and for that matter, Henderson had of uh, water surface profiles because they were basing the water surface profile calculation on Manning. So I said to myself, there's gotta be a better way to do this. And we worked on it. I worked with an Indian gentleman that came to work with us, and I said, there's got to be a better way to do it. I think that we can use the chassis instead of the Manning, and furthermore, we can use the modified chassis, which I had recently developed, the quadratic equation. And sure enough, after some work, we published a paper in the early 90s that showed that you could close the problem 
meaning the whole thing resolved, the problem of calculating water source profiles without having to resort to the Manning equation. Fascinating story. Uh, for those of you that have taken or are taking, well, I'm not teaching the class anymore, but that is contained in chapter seven of my Open Channel Hydraulics book. So those of you that are curious of what I just said, the closure of the water surface profiles equations, I refer you to chapter seven of my book, of my Open Channel Hydraulics book. So I think that this work that I did yesterday, it was good because it cleared the issue on all these things about how you calculate velocity in open channels. Okay, so now we're going to go into the next subject, which is critical shear stress versus, versus, versus critical velocity. And there's an online, online article and video. So let me show the video first, and then I will briefly talk about the vector form. Can you see the video? Yeah, we can. Okay. Thank you. I just want to make sure. A general relation between shear stress and mean velocity in open channel flow is derived. The relation is a function solely. By the way, why did we do this? Because if you look at the Chow book, which by the way is dated, even though everybody uses it, the Chow book was published in 1959. So it's exactly 63 years old. In the last 63 years, there's a lot of development that has happened in this area. But of course, that development is not in Chow's book. Chow published this book in 1959. It was a very good book at the time. Everybody loves the book for its accuracy. But certainly at this time, 2022, it is incomplete. It doesn't have a whole lot of the stuff that was developed in the last 60 years. Particularly, he doesn't mention anything about this issue that we're going to be discussing today. What is the relationship between the shear and the mean velocity? He mentions minimum velocity for design purposes, but he fails to relate it thoroughly and completely to the shear stress. We are doing that here. So let's keep going in here. Of the dimensionless Chessy friction factor F which is equal to one-eighth of the darcy Weisbach friction factor F sub D. The derived formula may be used to relate critical shear stress star sub C to critical velocity. So with this treatment, if you have one, you can find the other immediately. That's the benefit of it. Unlike Chow, which said that he didn't know the relationship. V sub C. The Chessy formula is the following, in which V equal mean flow velocity in meters per second, R equal hydraulic radius in meters, S equal channel slope in meters per meter, and C equal Chessy coefficient in meter to the one half power per second. From equation one, multiplying and dividing by the gravitational acceleration G, Defining the dimensionless Chessy friction factor F. The shear stress is defined as follows. Combining equations 5 and 6, the quadratic equation for shear stress is obtained, in which rho equal gamma over G equal mass density of water. can be shown that the dimensionless Chessy friction factor F is equal to one-eighth of the darcy Weisbach friction factor F sub D. The latter varies typically in the range 0 0.016 less than or equal to F sub D less than or equal to 0 0.04. Therefore, the typical range of variation of the dimensionless Chessy friction factor F is 0 0.002 less than or equal F less than or equal 0 0.005. Since rho equal a thousand newton second square per meter to the fourth power, equation seven can be expressed as follows. For the low value F equals 0 0.002, 
for the average value f equals 0 0.0035 or the high value f equals 0 0.005 in which tau is in newtons per square meter and v is in meters per second. Table 1 shows the values of shear stress tau as a function of mean velocity v for three values of friction factor, low, average, and high. The mean velocities vary between 1 and 6 meters per second. The associated shear stresses vary from 2 to 180 newtons per square meter. Table 2 shows a similar table in U.S. customary units. general relation between shear stress and mean velocity in open channel flow is derived. This relation is referred to as the quadratic equation for shear stress. The relation is a function solely of the dimensionless Chessy friction factor F, which is equal to one-eighth of the darcy Weisbach friction factor F sub D. In practice, the derived formula may be used to relate critical shear stress tau sub c to critical velocity v sub c. I got stuck in here. Let me see if I can... Okay. I got it. I got it. Uh, sometimes it does happen. Okay. So we saw the online video, so I'm just going to briefly show... I already showed the raster, now I'm going to show the vector. Briefly, because we already are being a little repetitious on this. So what we basically do is this, for those of you that are interested in our methodology, we first write a paper. And then after we write the paper, we have uh, the wherewithal, I guess you could say, eventually to put it in, in on video and then post it on YouTube. That very, very, uh, video that you just saw was posted on YouTube maybe three or four years ago. Uh, another thing we do, which is interesting though, as part of our methodology, is that we have a whole bunch of papers. But you know, and I've said this before and I'll say it again, the more publishable a paper becomes, the less readable it is. How does that work? Yeah, that is correct. Life is like that. If you gotta publish a paper, you gotta make it difficult because if you make it too easy, it would not read well with the reviewers that have to maintain a standard, so to speak. There's a certain high standard to publish in journals. So as a result of that, typically, if you can write a paper that will be published and you get all the benefit from the publication, but then it cannot be read because it was made difficult so that it is part of the possibility of getting it published. So I took a different route more than 20 years ago. I decided to write papers that I would publish directly on the web, asking nobody's permission based on the work I had already done, but bringing it down in the level so students can benefit from reading it and not having to spend a heck of a lot of time trying to figure out what we were saying or the communication of the technical matter. So this is an example of this critical shear stress by critical velocity. If I had to publish this in a journal, I would not have been able to publish it. It would be too easy. But for you, it would be fine because you can relate to it. You're at the level that you can relate to that. So therefore, having said that, then I wrote this paper back in the year 2014, as a matter of fact, it's dated the 10th of March of 2014, and this is, a form, this is this picture in here shows the, the, of the meander in the upper river that I think I talked about. Uh, it broke, the meander broke the bluff, and now the channel, and then the, the channel is, when it goes up, again in a flood, it will move the stuff. It will move the stuff out and it will clean it up, as we have shown in other places. That's part of what we call sediment transport. 
Okay, so this is what we defined in the in the in the video. You would remember that I, I said exactly this. So I believe uh, Jana da Silva, who was a one of our students back three or four years ago, I tasked her with putting this on video. And of course, when Jana started working for me back in the year 2018, she didn't know how to do it, but we taught her how to do it in the lab. And she became very good with, uh, as you can see, with uh, working on video editing so that we can take all these and put them into, into video so that we, they can be watched by YouTube. And YouTube, as you know very well, was uh, developed in the year 2006. And it was the, the third movement on the web. Why do I say the third movement? The first one was in the year 1993, 1994, when um, Tim Berners-Lee published his WWW, his World Wide Web, 1993, actually. And that was the first step in the development of the web. But it had to wait until the year 2000. In the year 2000, interactive ways of of working with the web were developed. Uh, among them, the leading program of the time was PHP. And we still use PHP in order to um, develop the myriad of programs that we have developed, more than 300 programs. We developed, we, we became good with PHP because we were doing it in, out, in and out. Uh, but things change, things do happen and change does happen. In the last few years, say in the last 10, 15 years, there's another kid on the block. It's his name or its name is, uh, um, what is the name? I always forget that name, Python. You All of you have heard of a Python, I'm sure. Python is now very popular. It has become a very, a very popular program. I believe that the popularity of Python must be ascribed to the fact that it is simpler, much simpler than PHP. So for one user of PHP, 20 years ago, everybody was using PHP, Every, those that could muster the energy in order to do it. But then 10, 15 years later, everybody's using Python. Very few people are now using PHP. Uh, but, so Python, because it's easier and more, I have not tried Python. I tried it, I was going to do it at what time, but I decided if I already had a Cadillac, why am I gonna go for the Volkswagen, right? Because Python is much, reduced in its capability. But at any rate, uh, let me just not sidetrack you on this issue. The point is that the second step or the second development of the web was in the year 2000, roughly the year 2000, which led to the development of all the social social stuff, Facebook and stuff. Uh, uh, Zuckerberg developed uh, Facebook, uh, I believe at the age of 19 years old in the year 2003. And you, the rest is history, Facebook, you know. And then why am I saying that there was a third? In the year 2005, six, there were a couple of uh, three people in working out of San Francisco that got together and developed uh, the engines that, uh, that power YouTube. And then subsequently a year later, Google bought it because they thought that there was a, they could not allow anybody to grow too big because Google was already big and they wanted to remain big. So Google bought out YouTube a year later I believe the, the payment, I believe it was posted, was a billion dollars. So these three kids, kids, because young men, these three young men became billionaires after one year of operation of YouTube. The rest is history. YouTube is now becoming the way to do it. As you can see, Wikipedia is also good. And I'm not going to put down Wikipedia. We use Wikipedia every single day, as well as you use YouTube every single day. And Google, like everybody else, okay? But if you talk raster, it will be YouTube. If you talk vector, it'll be Wikipedia. Basically, that's in. If you talk, um, I want information of the web, it'll have to be Google. So that's the way it works. So this is the vector version of that movie or that, that um, video that I just showed you. Okay, so that is it. Initiation, critical she stress, okay. So now we go, initiation of motion based on fruit number, online article and video. So we're going to do the same here. This is a, a video of 2011. I'm going to show this video because it's interesting. You're going to see Professor Pons in here 11 years ago. Uh, a bit of a change, I should say. First, let's take a look at the raster, and then we'll look at the video. Uh, I'm sorry. 
the raster, and then the vector. Note that our style to develop videos has changed over the years. At the beginning, we knew very little. I remember myself and my students in the year 2009 when we started doing this because we thought that it was the way to go. And the sooner we did it, the better off we were going to be. And I believe uh, September to November of the year 2009, we spent, our group spent two months trying to figure out how to do this. And finally, we broke the, the, the wall on it, and we learned. But it took us two months to learn. We had to ask everybody how to do this, how to do that. Some people didn't know how to do it. Eventually, just by virtue of being there, we did it. And we published our first videos in September, and then we improved the situation. And by November, we were doing very well. Now, this video is dated 2011. So this two years after we had began to publish our first videos. But it's still very, very rudimentary if you could put it that way. Let's see what you think about it. Note the clarity of this video compared to the previous video. The previous video was a little clearer, a little more clearer, wasn't it? And the reason for it at the beginning, we didn't think that uh, we were gonna go for clarity because we thought that get the information out and don't make it too heavy. But then later we changed course. We said the people want clarity. So however heavy it was going to be, we had to do it. And the only thing that we had to do from there on was to make sure that we stored it. We stored it for, for backup and that the backup engine was not going to be too small. It had to be a big engine in order to do the backup. You understand what I'm saying? Because if you do a video like this, like this, it's not that clear, the resolution is low, and therefore it's, it's light. And uh, another video that will con could have the same information, but it will be high resolution, will be two, three, four times as heavy, meaning size. Initiation of motion is the threshold at which bed material sediment particles start to move. That's your professor in the year 2011, by the way, 11 years ago. Moving open channel flow. This threshold is important in channel design in order to assure sediment movement and avoid clogging. The fruit number F equal 0 0.08 has often been taken as a minimum value to prevent clogging. In here, we derive a general fruit criterion for initiation of motion, confirming the validity of F equal 0 0.08 for a wide range of practical applications. This video in, in Vector article merit a story. When I arrived at San Diego State, uh, Colorado State, I'm sorry, in the year 1973 in order to pursue the PhD, the doctorate degree, um, I signed up under Professor Simons' program. He had a very large program. So because he had a lot of students, um, he had assistants that were helping him, junior faculty, basically. He was the head, full professor, and he had a whole bunch, maybe three or four or five assistant professors that were helping the grad students that had just signed up, among them myself. Okay? So I, was, I signed up with Khalid Mahmoud, with Professor Mahmoud from Pakistan, originally from Pakistan. And... Um, he said that he had a program in uh, a river mechanics. It was river mechanics uh, research program in Pakistan. So that kind of interested and fascinated me because I saw the chance to go to, go to Pakistan. And I've always liked to travel. So that one thing led to another. I eventually found myself in Pakistan doing my PhD dissertation. But that's not the story. The story is that within a couple of months that I had signed up with Khalid Mahmoud, he, I work with him every single day. And he told me one day that he, he said something like this. He said, Pons, um, this is a problem that continues to recur. What is the minimum fruit number for initiation of motion? And he said, I believe from our experience that it should be 0 0.08. But at this point, we haven't figured out the theory behind it. That's what he said. He basically was tasking me with doing some work, with doing some work in the area. Among the things that he had 
task me. And I do thank uh, Khalid Mahmoud and, and, and God for giving me the opportunity to be there at the right time, at the right place. Because I spent three years out there really learning a whole lot about these things that I, from which I was going to profit magnificently in the future years. Among them, my S-curve, which you will not hear me talk about it today be, or this in this class because the S-curve is not sedimentation engineering. It's uh, numerical hydraulics. But I teach that. I taught that, that last year. Those of some of you will remember my S-curve. So let's proceed in here. So what happened was that over the years, I always had in mind the, the chat that I have had for Professor Mahmoud, and I wanted to do this. And eventually, luck, one thing led to another, and I put together all the pieces of the puzzle in order to explain theoretically what was the minimum fruit number and show that, in fact, Mahmoud was correct. It was 0 0.08. It derived, of course, from the Shields criterion, because the Shields criterion is the, the basic idea. Nothing has been said after Shields in, in 1936. So let's proceed in here with the video. The Shields criterion for initiation of motion relates the dimensionless shear stress tau star with the boundary Reynolds number R star as shown in this figure. The solid curve separates motion above the curve from no motion below the curve. The Shields criterion is in which tau sub naught is the bottom shear stress, gamma sub s is the specific weight of sediment particles, gamma is the specific weight of water, d sub s is the sediment particle diameter. And tau star sub c is a dimensionless critical shear stress. For practical applications, the dimensionless critical shear stress tau star sub c can be taken as a constant for a wide range of boundary Reynolds numbers r star. The quadratic friction formula of fluid mechanics is. which rho is the mass density of water. F is a friction factor for open channel flow equal to one eighth of the Darcy Weiss by friction factor F sub D and V is the mean velocity. The fruit number is Let me do a caveat here. This is considered to be the fruit number, but in reality, this relates to the depth, not the hydraulic depth. And there's a slight difference between the depth of an, the depth of an open channel and the hydraulic depth. The hydraulic depth is the area over the wetted perimeter. And the depth is, is just the depth. It's not related to the hydraulics, but it is a depth, the depth of the channel. Which one of them is co the correct one? The correct one is the hydraulic depth. If you're going to do modeling, you would have to use the hydraulic depth. Otherwise, you're going to mess up. It's going to come up with an error which will propagate. So you have to use the hydraulic depth. So why are we using here D? Because we are working with, theoretically in here or in practice, actually, we're working with hydraulically wide channels. And in a hydraulically wide channel, the lowercase d is the same as the uppercase d, the hydraulic depth. So we didn't really at this point bother to explain that in this particular venue or paper. So this d should be taken loosely as the depth, but in reality, it should be the hydraulic depth, which is, uh, is defined by area, the area of flow over the top width in which G is the gravitational acceleration and D is the flow depth.
placing this equation and this equation into this equation results in In most cases, the ratio gamma sub s over gamma is equal to 2.65. Therefore, the fruit criterion reduces to As a convenient approximation, the shear's curve suggests a value of critical dimension of shear stress tau star sub c equal to 0 0.04 for a wide range of boundary Reynolds numbers. Now, in here, I have to stop because we have done this as a ballpark value, and for that purpose, we have taken the 0 0.04 critical dimensionless shear stress, which is the standard value taken off as an approximation, taken off the shear uh, curve, and I already talked about it last time. But in reality, if we want it to be accurate, more accurate, then we would have we have to do another type of calculation, which would have by force to be iterative. And we have done that later. But let's at this point keep working on this one. Therefore. The friction factor F varies normally in the range 0.002 to 0.005, which corresponds with Darcy Weisbach friction factors between 0.016 and 0.04. Here, we assume a mid-range value of F equal to 0.0035, corresponding to F sub D equal to 0.028. The fruit criterion reduces to for a given particle diameter relative to the flow depth. This equation states the fruit number that must be exceeded to assure initiation of motion. For instance, for d sub s over d equal to 0 0.0004 that is, a particle size of 0.4 millimeters in one meter of depth, this equation reduces to So, uh, Professor Mahmoud was in the ballpark. He said that the fruit number should be greater than 0 0.08. And we have now calculated for a certain uh, typical value that it was 0 0.087. For d sub s over d equal to 0 0.0003, this equation reduces to. So for 4 millimeters, it was 87. For 3 millimeters, it was 75. So Mahmoud was correct, exactly correct. And why am I using those numbers? Because those numbers are typical. 0.4 is a very typical size for grain D50 of sand, fine sand, which we find in the rivers. As an example, assume A, a friction factor F equal to 0 0.005, a high value, and B, a relative particle diameter D sub S over D equal to 0 0.0005, a high value. The application of this equation results in in terms of manning friction for a hydraulically wide channel we had to do the manning friction here because people require it or request it in SI units the fruit criterion for initiation of motion is Example, for flow depth D equal to 1 meter, mean diameter D sub S equal to 0.4 millimeters, and Manny's N equal to 0 0.02,
The fruit criterion is The Shields criterion of river mechanics is expressed in terms of the fruit number, enabling the calculation of the minimum fruit number for initiation of bed material sediment motion in open channel flow. Given critical dimensional shear stress, friction factor, and relative particle diameter, the developed relation confirms the validity of fruit number F equals 0 0.08 is a convenient descriptor of initiation of motion in most cases of practical interest. Let me get in here. Okay, so we are now in here finished with this. So now we are going to go to the vector. Same thing. The vector is the same thing. As I already told you the, the story behind why we do a vector and a raster in this issue. Okay, so that's exactly what went, what went into the video. By the way, I may uh, add at this point that by doing this procedure or methodology, it became very easy for us to develop the videos because if you want to develop a video, you have to have a content. And the content has to be accessible to most people. It cannot be too difficult. If it's too difficult, nobody will see it. Nobody will watch it or read it. Watch it, meaning television, YouTube. I happen to know because over the course of 40 years of, of my own career, I wrote, wrote many, many papers, but the ones that are recognized by, by the profession are the ones that are published in journals. And I, over the years, since beginning in the year 77 and going all the way to 2003, so that's 26 years, I published 52 papers, exactly double, twice, two papers per year. 52 papers is my record of, of journal publication. And that was fine and dandy and got me promotions and credit and so forth. And glory, I guess you could say. Some of my papers were really good. Some others were not as good, right? But it happens. But the point I'm trying to make in here is that some of the papers, because of the fact that they needed to be published, were almost unreadable. And I can tell you, I can confess to you at this point, that a couple of those papers I can't even read. And I wrote them. So that was 30, 40 years ago. Understandably, I forgot. But they are so thick in mathematics that uh, I honestly don't know. It's their use. It's very limited use uh, for those papers because they cannot be read. Okay, well, thank you very much for this. And now we finish over here. We have a few minutes. We got four minutes. Let me go back. Let me go back in here. We, I have a couple of more things in here that I wanted to discuss with you. Before we get to the Simons and Richardson uh, milestone paper, minimum fruit number and minimum permissible velocity using the Shields criterion. Okay, here we go. Remember I said earlier that in that previous paper we assumed the value of the critical shear stress of, of um, uh, that the critical shear stress, uh, 0 0.04, you would recall that that was the number. But then I said later, that that was an approximation because in reality, if you look at the Shields curve, not all the values under the Reynolds number, under the Van der Reynolds numbers are 0 0.04. So uh, the 0 0.04 was, was adopted or taken as an approximation. What am I saying in here? The 0 0.04 is over here. So we're saying that, that as if, as if, when, when uh, Shields did his work, he came over here from the laminar regime, he approached, he approached this, he got into 0, 0, 004, and he became all flat in here, all the way to here, and then he went up. But the curve, the actual curve, is not flat. It goes all the way down to 0 0.031, as you can see. But in order to do a, ca a proper calculation, we would have to do an iterative calculation. And most people in practice either couldn't do it or they, they didn't care to do it 
But we decided to do it because we can do it. We can. We are very adept at using the computer. Programming. And I don't want to talk too much about it because, like I said, I run into trouble. But you, it, this whole thing can be done also with, with Excel sheets. In Excel, that some people are very good at Excel. But Excel has a way of as a way of getting the opposite. In other words, if the problem gets very complex, the Excel programming very, gets very complex. On the other hand, in programming, it's the opposite. The more complex the program, the simpler it, it turns out to be, the, the programming undertaking turns out to be. So it's good for very large, big problems. So Excel is very simple and very convenient if you're going to do a spreadsheet. Originally, don't forget that Excel developed as the ultimate spreadsheet on the computer. It was, as a matter of fact, the Excel is called spreadsheet, which is the sheet that the accountants were using. And the accountants weren't using hardly any multiplication. It was all sum and, sum and subtract. But then later it became apparent that once the engineers started using the spreadsheet, they needed to multiply, they needed to do this, all kinds of fancy stuff. And the Excel spreadsheet became, became very complicated to the point where, at this point, you can do just about everything. But at what cost? At the cost of additional complexity okay so so here now what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to uh, to review this this gray box in here minimum fruit number and minimum permissible velocity it's the same thing only that now we're going to use an iteration I got a couple of minutes and I think I can do it so we got this equation we already discussed equation 6-2 we already discussed 6-3 6-4 6-5 you've seen all this in the video and in the in the vector and the previous vector. So the only difference between this and the previous one is that this is going to be iterative. So how are we going to do this? Then we calculate 0.87 and 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.27. So from to up to here, we haven't said anything new because we assume the value of 0.04 here, 0.04. Practical applications, a constant value of dimension is critical shear stress is this. Now, from here on, then, we go iterative. A sum of more precise value of minimum fruit number and minimum permissible velocity may be obtained by using the actual value of dimension of critical shear stress in lieu of the convenient approximation. This procedure, however, requires an iteration. And for this purpose, the following algorithm is suggested. And this is something we've done extensively, and it's not big a deal anyway. You just have to keep your mind clear and do it. We assume the Reynolds number find the critical shear, shear stress, solve for the, the, the bottom shear stress, calculate the shear velocity, calculate the new value of the Reynolds number, and then check if it was close to the previous one. If it's, if it's the same or close to the previous one within a certain tolerance, a small tolerance, we use the last value of critical shear stress. Otherwise, we return to step. So it does, it does this in several, uh, several uh, iterations. And uh, finally, finally, we use this over here. Yeah, we use this calculator. And we get the calculation of minimum fruit number. Let me see if I can do this right now. Uh, let me see if I can do this right now. Particle diameter, 0.5, flow depth, 1 meter. I mentioned the Chessy friction factor, let's say 0, 0, 0, 5, the water temperature 20 degrees, and we calculate. So we did the calculation. Minimum permissible velocity 0.28, number of iterations 4. So with that, we're done. We're done for today. So um, next uh, Tuesday, we're going to go to A18, which is the, the uh, milestone paper by Simons and Richardson. Both of these people were my professor. Simons, my major professor, and Richardson was one of my mentors when I was at Colorado State about 40 years ago. Thank you very much. Any questions at this point? Uh, professor?